Thank you for checking out Murder Dictionary Podcast. I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer that we are still learning the ropes of audio and podcasting in general. The sound quality and content will get better as we get more experience, so please bear with us through this learning curve. We focus mostly on the murderers, so some listeners may feel that the subject is approached too lightheartedly and with a lack of focus on the victims. Although we want to be sensitive to that, we cannot help but focus on the details or facts that we find most fascinating. And for us, that is often the life of the murderer and the details of the crimes. We appreciate you checking us out and hope that you are also interested in the stories that we are intrigued enough by to explore. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance. And welcome to another episode of Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna, and with me is Kelly. Yo. Before we get started, we just wanted to remind you guys that we do have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like the show, definitely go follow us there. We've got memes, serial killer stuff, breaking news, all the stuff you want to know about true crime. We got you. Yeah, or if you just want to talk to us late at night (laughs) while you're in bed, you can just send us DMs, slide into our DMs. No murders, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Non-murderers only. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take petty crime. <laughs> hey, 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 speak for yourself, lady. <laughs> if you enjoy the show, definitely check us out there. We're going to link it at the bottom of the description and the show notes. Make it easy for you. Along with that, we're going to have articles and information from our research. So you can check out more information if you're interested. Um. We also have a Patreon set up, and we're going to be coming out with stickers and buttons soon, so definitely look us up on there. If you happen to support us on Patreon, send us your address so we can send you stuff. They're coming soon, so we definitely want to get them to you. Like my panties. (laughs) (laughs) Stupid. So, this week, Lorna is a Patreon. (laughs) Lorna, you get in my panties. You want a thong, granny panties, or a cute cheeky short? And let me know your favorite color. They're coming your way. (laughs) So, thank you to Lorna for being a Patreon supporter this week. We want to shout you out. Yeah. Um, We also wanted to uh, shout out Esther from the podcast Once Upon a Crime. We are totally obsessed with that show. We love it. If you're not listening to her, definitely check it out. It's Once Upon a Crime podcast. Thanks, Esther. She's wonderful. She's always supporting us. And she has awesome crime series. So she goes into like music, crime. She goes into art. She's Mm -hmm. on an art series right now. So if you're an art buff, definitely check this out. She's wonderful. So we just wanted to holler at her as well and say thank you. I just got to say the people that support this show just revive my faith in humanity. <laughs> I thought like people just suck sometimes, especially when people are online. People can be so mean and fucking people are so cool here. We yeah, got nothing but cool. We definitely appreciate that. Yeah. You guys are really awesome. and We appreciate your positive feedback and your interaction with us. And we appreciate you hollering at us on social media. We love you guys. Yeah. Holler. <laughs> This week, we are on part two of our hybristophilia subject, so Kelly is going to get it started. In the spring and summer of 1985, Richard Ramirez terrorized California while on a spree of violent sexual assaults and murders. 
There was panic and heavy media coverage of the crimes, and he was called the Night Stalker while still at large. Ramirez was captured in Los Angeles and convicted of 13 murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. Immediately after capture, Ramirez began receiving tons of female attention and support, probably because of those cheekbones. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Ooh. if I'd try and marry him, but I'd watch a contour video. <laughs> oh my god, contour, His contour on fucking is point. On <laughs> oh. He was sent an overwhelming amount of romantic letters and fan mail. The media often reported on the unusual amount of female fans at the court throughout Richard's trial. He has those followers that look like Winona Ryder in oh my Beetlejuice. God. Oh my oh, okay. <laughs> Sick hat or what? <laughs> All black. Just exactly. Yeah. Black sunglasses, hats, yeah. a lot of dark hair. <laughs> uh, one of the women who was apparently sprung on Richard was an alternate juror named Cindy Hayden. When one of the primary jurors got dismissed, Cindy eagerly accepted the juror position. Ramirez was aware that she had taken a liking to him and saw an opportunity to get a hung jury by fueling her affections. He made a point to maintain eye contact with her in a somewhat flirtatious manner in order to further her crush. On Valentine's Day, Cindy sent Richard a cupcake with the message, I love you, written in icing on the top. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> whoa, 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 you're moving too fast. I just fucking made eye contact with you. Fucking. He looked at me. I love him. <laughs> oh, my God. He is ridiculous. But he's smart for fucking No, he brilliant. knows how to manipulate. Yep. He's a brilliant manipulator. Yep. In 1989, Richard was found guilty and sentenced to death. Because of the verdict and sentence, it became clear that Richard's plan did not work, and Hayden had not been as blindly devoted to him as he had believed. Burn. <laughs> <laughs> At the time that the verdict was read, Cindy made a series of apologetic gestures to Ramirez across the courtroom, communicating that she felt bad and had no choice. I don't know if that was like a shrug, like a oops. Yeah, like a, exactly. It's just like, I'm so sorry. Yeah, but I like, would just not say hide anything. my eyes and like <laughs> look away and just, mm, mm, uh, nope. A, Ramirez apparently forgave Hayden and invited her to visit him in jail, where she proclaimed she was in love with him. She even went so far as to bring her parents to a visitation for an introduction to Richard. Parents have to deal with a lot where they're like, is my kid going to like be a stripper? Yeah. Is my kid going to be on drugs? Yeah. But can you imagine if your kid came home and was like, can you come to visit Richard Ramirez with me? <laughs> it would be even better if she didn't tell them who she was visiting. She's like, look, I'm really in love with this man. Right. And I just need you to meet him. We're going to go support. brunch. Yeah. <laughs> Just can you guys please, please support me and come and you go and it's fucking Richard oh, Ramirez yeah. who's all over the news and right. shit like that. That'd be great. <laughs> It'd be I would love to prank my parents like that. That would be so good. They deserve that shit. <laughs> I'm all for that. I yeah. will help you. Yeah. <laughs> that would them. be great. Oh man. After the trial, she made television appearances stating the trial was unfair due to inadequate representation. She even claimed Ramirez had experienced temporary insanity as a result of being possessed by the devil at the time of his crime, which she believes should have been explored by his lawyers during trial. How the fuck do you... <laughs> you know, the old the old devil defense. <laughs> oh, oh, he was possessed. Oh, that makes sense. Well, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> He's free. <laughs> he and Cindy grew apart. So soon, L.A.'s most eligible bachelor, Richard Ramirez, met Burbank good girl gone bad, Doreen Leoy. <laughs> God, you know exactly what a Burbank girl looks right? like, too. I already know what it is. A Burbank good girl, and I got her in my mind. I don't even need to see her. Am I saying that right? Leoy? Yeah. Okay. She looks like a, an unstable teacher or something. <laughs> like, the way her face is and the way she dresses. God, just not like... what I was thinking. I was thinking more Hillary Duff. That's, no, that's what I think of when I think of Burbank girls. I don't she know. She looks like someone that seven-year-old me would be afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know if she's going to start crying or yeah. yell or whatever, like a teacher going through a divorce or something. Yes. <laughs> yes. Love them. Leo grew up in a quiet L.A. suburb of Burbank and had a seemingly normal childhood. She was a twin, and by all accounts, her sister was the more outgoing of the pair. Friends and relatives described Doreen as introverted and reclusive, even stating she lived in a fantasy world. She could have been on Neopets if it was the right time. She could have been me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's my life. <laughs> in the early 1980s, their mother died after a long and painful battle with cancer at the young age of 51. Family members say that Doreen was extremely close to her mother and was completely devastated by the loss. 
Family members say that the loss of her mother was the beginning of a downward spiral. Leoy worked for the magazine Tiger Beat, and when the company relocated to the East Coast, she decided not to relocate. I fucking love Tiger Beat. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> I had this poster of Justin Timberlake underneath a waterfall in a white wife beater just getting drenched by the <laughs> water. I remember it, that it, picture. It, that was curly, Justin. Super curly. So good. It was like over my bed. Wow. Uh, it was hot. Over your bed, Over too? my bed, That's yeah. And I had bunk beds, so I was on the top bunk. Super Woo! close. Yeah. It's like he was right there. It's like he's looking. He was staring me in my eyes like Richard <laughs> Ramirez did to fucking... <laughs> But he actually liked me and didn't need me to, you know, gain his, you know, freedom. So <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> her unemployment was long and stressful. It was very difficult for her to find work again in Los Angeles. Doreen's twin sister and older brother both married. And although she had desired to find a partner as well, she struggled to maintain long term relationships. Her twin was also becoming quite successful after being elected to the school board. The still unemployed Doreen moved in with her grandmother to alleviate some financial stress. Her sister says she was isolated and alone during this time when she first saw Richard. When she, so sad. She's in such a bad place. Yeah. She's, I mean, especially because you have your twin who's like, you know. Everybody else is doing great. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, I, I have no job. I live with, with my, my grandma. grandma. Like, yeah. Uh, she's just a perfect Perfect. I don't want to say victim. But yeah. Just, she's in a place that's ripe for exploitation, mm -hmm. pretty much. Isolated, alone, broke. Self questioning, self doubt. Yeah. Yeah. I'd need a daddy too. <laughs> <laughs> Doreen explained that she first had feelings for Richard on Friday, August 30th, 1985. She was watching Dallas when police coverage interrupted her TV show to broadcast his picture on the night before his arrest. Doreen said, Looking back, I see it was a turning point for me. They showed his mugshot in the middle of Dallas, and I saw something in his eyes, something that captivated me. It wasn't as if I knew him, but there was something in his eyes, maybe the vulnerability. I don't really know. How fugly does everybody on Dallas have to be <laughs> <laughs> for you to be like, damn, Richard. <laughs> what a boo. And I looked at like, I'm like, any pictures of him? It's not, I mean, doesn't look vulnerable. <laughs> no, I never. Mean, I wouldn't <laughs> use that word to describe him. Not at all. Mm -mm. Leroy began writing letters to newspapers under false names to lend support to Ramirez during his murder trial. And when her family learned of this, they tried to stop her. Can you imagine finding that out? <laughs> like, no. Don't do it. <laughs> Here's some other prisoners you can write to. Right? <laughs> when their attempts to stop her failed, her family began to express their disapproval by distancing themselves from her. Her involvement escalated from writing to newspapers to writing directly to Richard. Leo was worried that Richard wasn't being treated fairly while awaiting trial. So she initially reached out with a birthday card to cheer him up. They corresponded with approximately 75 letters over the course of about a year. Then Ramirez invited her to visit. Doreen saw Richard as an attractive, vulnerable man who still exhibits what she called boyish qualities. Nope. No, not at all. <laughs> nope. Ugh. Maybe his fucking flawless hair is kind of cute and boyish. <laughs> that hair does. And healthy. That fucking feather. Oh, my God. <laughs> he did have a nice flip going on. <sighs> in jail too because you know how everyone like after you see them in jail for a while they look fucked up. up yeah yep. like they ha like just fucked up and he looked always looking fly like is there a hair dryer in fucking jail <laughs> like what he looked uh windswept yes, or exactly <laughs> whimsical <laughs> on her third visit in july of 1988 he just looked at doreen and said i wish to marry you she immediately accepted his proposal Doreen said, I never found the one who was everything to me rolled into one. It may sound strange, but that's who I believe Richard is. Leoy began visiting Richard four times a week and was often one of the first people in the visiting line. It's like a new PlayStation's coming out. She's <laughs> first in line. <laughs> Camping out. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> San Quentin prison policy is to conduct wedding ceremonies the first Thursday of every month. 36-year-old Richard married 41-year-old Doreen on October 3rd, 1996 in a ceremony with 10 other inmates, including two other death row inmates. That's a lot of people getting yeah, married. A lot. A lot of hybristophiliacs. <laughs> I wonder if his, his, if 
the two other death row inmates were like friends or they just happened to be there. They're just like, oh, I guess <laughs> I guess that's what's going down. Well, no, I think that they were getting married. That's the thing. There were 10 other inmates oh, that were getting stupid. married. I thought it was because remember, remember they had like a lot. They were allowed 10 people. It's that number 10 that's mm-hmm. throwing me Smoke off. Smoke weed every day. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I? Uh, yeah. Shit. Okay. Ramirez's mother, Mercedes, his older brother, Ruben, sister, Rosa, and 17-year-old niece, Rachel, attended the nuptials. None of Leo's family members attended. Dude, there was – um, I can't even remember the specifics, so I probably shouldn't say it, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> but there were reports that he had hit on his own niece, and I don't know if this was that <sighs> niece. I know. Disgusting. But he was just, like, hardcore going at her. Maybe she had the same cheekbones. contour on point he couldn't help himself (laughs) (laughs) after leo said i just want to say i'm ecstatically happy today and very very proud to have married richard and be his wife the bride dressed in a white lace wedding dress and the groom who wore his blue prison garb were allowed to kiss three times once before the ceremony once during and once after the wedding service Leo gave Ramirez a silver wedding band because Richard said Satanists do not wear gold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Red flag. You can't argue with him. He's certainly right. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could just cut out like one kiss after and then she could just push his head down towards her vagina. <laughs> just one big sloppy kiss. <laughs> Can we just trade one of those kisses for like, you know, mouth action? <laughs> yeah. Three quarters of a blowjob. <laughs> just the tip. At the time of their wedding, Doreen's twin sister was running for re-election to the Burbank school board. Denise Lewis stated to the local media, We don't have a relationship anymore because of this. It's been very difficult for the family. It's a tragedy for the victim's family as as well. It's a tragedy for a lot of people today. However, it seemed Denise was only seeking to distance herself from her sister in the media to preserve public perception because it quickly became clear that she was lying about their ongoing family relationship. Denise claimed that she had not seen her sister in ages, when in fact Doreen was staying with the family during the media frenzy following their marriage. Doreen was even seen driving around in a black Ford Taurus with a giant campaign poster for her sister in the back window. (laughs) (laughs) Although her sister may have lied at the time, Doreen eventually did become estranged from her family. I don't know what they would expect for the whole family to claim her. Like, yeah, that's my sister. (laughs) We're so proud of her. (laughs) She caught a good one. Right? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't see my family supporting me at all. No. In that. Nope. Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. I mean, my family is pretty down, but yeah. not for that. <laughs> yeah, not, not for murder. Leo says people believe she was marrying Richard for publicity, fame, or to make money writing a book. Oh, I mean, what, what's wrong with that? Like, because- <laughs> <laughs> I don't see. I don't get it. I yeah. don't see the problem here. <laughs> make some money. <laughs> Isn't that why you get married? Yeah, Am fuck I confused? that guy. Yeah. <laughs> It's the same thing exactly in a relationship. I'll probably get – I mean, I may not get fame, <laughs> but I might get some money. But it's just – I don't know. How are people going to blame her? She's exploiting someone that's an awful, terrible Yeah, murder. exploit like, that motherfucker. That guy, yeah. You know? Jump in on it. As the years passed, with their relationship fading out of the public eye, it was clear that she had married him for love and didn't have ulterior motives. Leo even promised she would commit suicide when he was finally executed. I mean, that's a little too far. That's down as fuck. I might cry a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) I might be a little sad. I might get a Tinder account. (laughs) I might wait like a day or two before finding another D. Yeah, I might write that book and cash (laughs) in on my shit. (laughs) Richard died in 2013 of liver failure at just 53 years old after spending 24 years in prison. The exact cause of the ailment has not been released due to federal patient privacy laws, but witnesses say before his death, he turned, quote, green as a highlighter pen. There are no records of a divorce, and it seems he was still married to Leo in 2013. That is so gnarly. The green highlighter pen yeah. part? Okay. Yeah, no, that's gross. Ooh. That's what happens with cirrhosis of the liver, right? Really? Liver failure, right? Don't you turn a weird color? You're the medical professional. No, here. I don't. I don't. <laughs> you probably turn weird colors anyway when you're about to die. I don't think. Yeah. I don't think you're glowing with porcelain skin. <laughs> <laughs> However, his estranged niece, Shelley Ramirez, stated several weeks after his death, Ramirez's body had not been claimed. Scott Robinson, a spokesperson from San Quentin, said there had been a conversation with his next of kin, but the body would be cremated if no one claimed it. 
Apparently, Ramirez was denied personal visit privileges in 2010, and the last few years he has refused to visit with everyone. Doreen Leoya has not been heard from in years, and her whereabouts are unknown. Her last interactions with the media in years prior indicated that she was no longer close to any family members or friends due to their disapproval of the relationship. Wherever Leo is today, she has obviously made an effort to stay out of the public eye. She didn't claim his fucking ashes. I would have nope. jarred that, bagged it up, sold it on eBay. <laughs> like, you she get a piece. She should have learned from Star. Yeah, exactly. She's been like taking it on tour and everything. Ugh. She could have really capitalized on that. Money. But she was a creepy lady. Was she? Yeah, she was, I don't know, just her look, her just weird. Now don't judge. <laughs> <laughs> she just looked she like just mentally looked unstable school teacher. Does she have like a like a lazy eye like I do? <laughs> <laughs> you mean she's sexy as fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does she drool and have a lazy eye? <laughs> I get judged a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was just something about her, just seeing her in interviews and just her whole like presentation yeah. of self and the way she talked about him was there's something off with that lady. Yeah. You know? You know what's weird too is that I, I don't have it's not that it's not sympathy, but I don't fucking get when people can stand halitosis, like, you ever meet, <laughs> yeah, you ever meet, like, couples, and then, like, one of them has really bad breath, and you're just like, how the fuck does she or he deal with that? Yeah, it's pretty nasty. Oh. There's a lot of things that you can deal with, but that's one of those things that's pretty repulsive. It can't get better in prison, too. No way. No, yeah, it's got to get a lot worse. <laughs> yeah, he was, like, super smelly mm -hmm. by all accounts. Yeah. And a chronic masturbator and would try and fuck everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Family members, any lady, anybody that wrote to him. He was just crazy. So, but she was in love. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, who did they get? What actor? What's his name? That they got to play Richard Ramirez? It looks dead Lou like. Diamond Phillips. Yes. Thank you. LDP. <laughs> exactly like him. He does. He does. It was so good. Like older Ramirez though. Not like younger yeah. Ramirez. He looks like if Ramirez got hit with a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> He's His face is a little like flatter, you know. <laughs> He's probably got better breath, though. I'm just oh guessing. for sure. Yeah. Every person ever has better breath. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Up next, we have Rosalie Cacciatore. It just sounds like food. Mm, yeah, right. I was like that, Italian that's the sounds only way delicious. to pronounce it, but it still makes me hungry. Mm, <laughs> it's got cheese in it for sure. Oh, Whatever for sure. It it's like double baked. You put it back in the oven. <laughs> the cheese is like kind of brown on top. Mm, God damn it. Let's get some cheese. <laughs> so Rosalie Cacciatore grew up in Florida in a very controlling Catholic Sicilian household with parents who were extremely overprotective and overbearing with their daughter. This is going to have a good ending. I can oh, so this tell. is going to work out really yeah. well, like every time, you know? Her father, Joe, was a hardworking mechanic who ran a gas station and later became an executive with an oil company. That's a big leap. Yeah, that's like, <laughs> that's the same like kind Started of job. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Yeah, good for you, Joe. Get it. Maybe I should be very controlling and or people should control me and then maybe I'll become an oil executive. It's the key to success. Yeah. <laughs> Start being overprotective and overbearing right now. Yes. Let's go to mass too. <laughs> Her mother, Margarita, was a tailor at JCPenney, which sounds adorable. I didn't know JCPenney. Oh, back in the day had tailors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when that was a real job. Back in the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> Rosalie says she was not to bring friends to the house or see boys. When she was 15, she met Victor Martinez at a basketball game between her high school and his. Victor was from a wealthy, prominent family, and Rosalie's parents were quite impressed by him. So they wouldn't let her date until she brought home someone that was from dude. a wealthy family. Yeah, you can't talk to <laughs> That's boys. Fucked up. He's got money in. Oh, totally. Maybe he'll go pay date. For yeah, <laughs> maybe he'll pay for your college, Rosalie. Jeez. The pair married in June 1979 in an extravagant wedding with more than a thousand guests. She was only 19 and he was 21. She's not even old enough to drink. Right. What the <laughs> fuck is going on? You can't make life decisions like that. I'll never understand that. No. People getting married that young. And I know it works out for some people and that's fucking fantastic. Yeah. However, damn. Yeah, like, we were so cool with that. That does not sound okay. They're like, you oh, can't you're make that kind of decision as a teenager. Yeah. Come on. You can have a baby at 16, though, and get married at 16 back in the day, too. So oh, that's... yeah. I mean, I know things have changed, but it just, I don't know. That's crazy. 
When they returned from their honeymoon, she was excited to open all the presents, but she arrived home to discover that all the gifts had already been opened and most of them returned and her mother-in-law had already written out thank you notes. Oh, hell no. I would be Fuck so no. pissed. That's fucked up. That's like when someone eats your food that you're really excited to get. And, like, you're like, and you, I've cried. You're like, I put something. my name on that yogurt, <laughs> dog. <laughs> what the fuck did you touch it? I didn't even get a bite. I didn't even get to enjoy it a little. You fucking ruined it. You fucking terrible person. I, oh. Amy finished some cinnamon rolls last week and we're still beefing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude, how dare you? Yeah, I've definitely cried over I will over never someone. trust you again. <laughs> Where are my fucking rolls, man? We ain't cool till I get at least a dozen of rolls. Mm. Where are you going every time she leaves the house? You better be Cinnabon, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> she quickly discovered that the expectation was for her to become an obedient socialite and housewife. I'm just taking drugs and pills. That's right? It. I'm like, fine, I'll do That's it. That's what happens. Uh, yeah, I'll you vacuum. Just go to the psychiatrist. Yeah, mommy needs another Merlot. <laughs> Get me a duster. I'll dust this shit up. <laughs> <laughs> Come out, she's passed out. Yeah. Where'd the kids go? I don't know, man. <laughs> in another controlling move, Victor's family had bought them a condo in Houston, where Victor was attending law school. Rosalie says that in 17 years of marriage, she never had her own credit card, went out shopping alone, chose who to become friends with, or was allowed an opportunity to weigh in on family decisions. She's like a celebrity. Pretty, Pretty much. much. Yeah. She, she's got a whole team of people just managing her. Just give me one credit card. Just one. <laughs> one solid credit card. I can just do online shopping. Fuck it. <laughs> That's fine. Rosalie even describes how she would dress how her husband wanted in clothes and accessories that Victor had specifically instructed her to wear. <sighs> Never ever. All fishnet. <laughs> <laughs> slutty, slutty G-string. Just red lace and that's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that's fine, but... But I need you in a fireman's outfit at all times. <laughs> I'll wear this leather harness, yeah. but as long as you're just wearing a thong with an elephant trunk for your dick, <laughs> then we're cool. Yeah. <laughs> After Victor completed law school in 1982, the couple returned to Tampa, where he became a prosecutor for the state's attorney's office. She was allowed to attend court reporters' classes while pregnant with their second child. When she finished, her father-in-law put her in an office and began referring clients to her. I mean, that's cool, but I'm kind of curious on what court reporter classes are. <laughs> uh, that sounds kind of cool. Is, this, is that at my local community college? or That's what a stenographer is, right? So she's just typing all day long? Oh. I think. Okay. Or maybe yeah. I'm tripping. Maybe that's different. I'm thinking like they report on things in court, but yeah, that makes that sense. That would be a journalist, though. Yeah, you're right. That's why we I was like, how do you take classes? Up. Yeah. We're clearly not professionals. <laughs> we don't know what we're talking about. It's weird, too, with stenographers. Don't they have like, they don't have a whole keyboard? Yeah, they it's, have one of those like little tiny. Yeah, it's yeah. like shorthand, but on typewriting. Yes. It's fucking weird. And Crazy. They just, and they don't even look, they don't even look at anything. They're just like straight, dead eyed. Just, I want to be able to type that well. Yeah, I bet you could. Especially in a non existent language. <laughs> Sick. But I would be afraid that, like, if uh, someone just like what just happened, if someone said something funny and I got, got a case of the yiggles, <laughs> <laughs> and I would just like. <laughs> I know. You and I laugh too yeah. much. We laugh at everything. Yeah. We would we could not be sitting in courts. Especially when you're in like class or something or where it's really serious and you can't laugh, it makes it so much worse. Oh, it's like, so I much just, harder. Yeah, I hate it's, it. It's like someone get me out and then you're just all red and then Yes. Especially if it's a can't murder breathe, case. Yeah. You're just falling out. You have to make an excuse to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so you have to stop everyone in court so that you can As just have the off. giggles in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I gotta go. Stomach ache. Real bad. Gotta take. I got the poops. <laughs> but I really got the yiggles. <laughs> Whatever income she earned was expected to be turned over to her husband. He's her pimp. Pretty much. What Jesus. The they had four children, and she became quite well known in the area as a socialite and wife of the famous criminal defense attorney. They lived in a $375,000 home in an exclusive upscale community of Brandon, just east of Tampa, Florida. 
She was always seen in designer clothes, expensive jewelry, and carpooling her kids to private school and various activities in her Mercedes. I wonder if she just wore like Sean John or Rockaway. <laughs> <laughs> Fubu. <Just> Fubu. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy Hilfiger. <laughs> I went into a really deep internet hole last night, and I don't even know how it happened. <laughs> but I was looking up Tommy Hilfiger's son. Have you ever seen him? No. He looks like Jared Leto's Joker. <laughs> I oh, not. but like I'm kind of but also on. a baby face Tommy Hilfiger, like the same thing. That's a but weird. just young. No, no, it's, I have to. Google he looks that. so ridiculous. That's kind of creepy. That's... Yeah, it's not good. And he's dating Rita Ora. Thank you, Internet. (laughs) Ooh, Rita Ora. Yeah, I know, right? Mm. After 17 years of marriage, their kids were 14, 12, 7, and 6. So Rosalie was no longer needed full-time at home and began to put more energy into her career. She became a social worker. However, she was still seeking more independence. She was working as a licensed private investigator and mitigation specialist for the Public Defender's Office. She was given Oscar Boleyn's case. Dude, she does a lot. She's a social worker, court reporter classes, private investigator, mitigation specialist. Like, what? Yeah, I can barely do one thing. Yeah. (laughs) I can't even type, let alone fucking... Walk and chew gum. Yeah. mm -mm. (laughs) Oscar was a drifter, a carny, a trucker, an alleged drug dealer. Also, jack of all trades, like a renaissance man. I can't even be a carny. I can't even. I can't even drift properly. Dog, I believe in you. I think if you tried, you could be a carny. I'll try harder. Thank you. Thanks for that motivation. <laughs> Bolin had pled guilty to a vicious 1988 kidnapping and gunpoint rape, which he was serving 25 to 75 years for in Ohio. He was identified as a suspect in another case, so police came to arrest him in the Ohio prison. Wait, do you get arrested in the Ohio prison and they take you somewhere else? Like, yeah. They're like, what? <laughs> yeah, so I think can- there's some sort of paperwork of just, yeah. you know, seeing what case takes precedence or yeah. whatever, so that they can probably have them serve concurrent sentences back yeah. to back, but just for the trial, he may have been extradited to another place. Damn, he he probably like thought like something cool was happening. They come to a cell. It's like, field trip! <laughs> You're in trouble Aww, again. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> he was identified as a suspect in another case, so police came to arrest him in Ohio for the 1986 murders of three young Tampa women. Bolin maintained his innocence of the three murders, saying he was a very angry and troubled man when he committed his first crime. But he had learned things and would not do the same thing again. Like get caught. Right? (laughs) (laughs) He openly admitted he was guilty of kidnapping and rape for the first case, but he did not murder the three women. He was found guilty of the three murders and sentenced to death. After his death sentence, Martinez was assigned to assist in his appeals process. The case's prosecutor, Michael Halkatitties. How- how- <laughs> <laughs> it looks like Halkatitties. How- I think it's Halkitis. <laughs> Sounds like a terrible disease. Right? He's got the Halkitis. <laughs> The case's prosecutor, Michael Halkaitis, said the guy is a serial killer, a Ted Bundy type, who is able to mesmerize women. He speaks softly, he looks nice, and that's how he gets these women to come with him. He preyed on young, attractive girls. Boleyn was considered to be a dangerous psychopath and con man, who was an escape risk that frequently made direct threats to police and corrections officers. The day Rosalie met Oscar, she was escorted into Boleyn's cell with two shotgun-wielding guards standing by. Love at first sight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she says that she felt like she was going in to see Hannibal Lecter, so when he arrived, she nervously made her introduction. She told Oscar, I'm your angel. I want to save your life. Boo. Yeah, what? Bad pickup line. How about hi? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Coming in hot, man. What you in here for? <laughs> Jesus. I want to say, that's just giving him so much hope. Yeah, that's, come on, man. It's too much. What if he was just like tight, tight? Okay. <laughs> Sick. <Yeah. laughs> he replied, prove it. Ooh, all right. That's it. All right. 
This is the best beginning of a porno it's ever. Just an audio podcast, but Kelly just rubbed her nipples. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, I'll prove it. <laughs> Their initial meeting lasted five hours, and Martinez said she instantly felt an affinity for him. Over the next two years, Oscar and Rosalie became close. Her experience of controlling parents and husband made her relate to his isolation, confinement, and loneliness. Rosalie said she would bring depositions to Oscar and have him underline things that were inconsistent. He just does the whole page. <laughs> <laughs> All of it, babe. Just yeah. check it out. <laughs> They're lying. They're ignorant. <laughs> <That's> ignorant. <laughs> so ignorant. <laughs> so ignorant. <laughs> Martinez spent many hours every day talking to Bolin in his jail cell, virtually neglecting her family. Also, misconduct. She must have had other cases is what I was thinking. Yeah. Like when I read that, I'm just like, this can't be the only thing you're working on. So you're spending hours and hours flirting with this dude when other people need their appeals processed too. Uh, D is always more important. <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> Priorities, you know. D first, then other people's lives. <laughs> then my job. She also took a road trip starting in Bolin's hometown, then retracing his moves through Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee to learn more about him. What What can you... Oh, they don't have the internet back then. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, Facebook? This was pre-Facebook, so okay. you couldn't look that up. <laughs> I was watching a step up last night, step up to the streets. Really? <laughs> and he said, yeah, just catch me on MySpace or something. <laughs> I fucking laughed so hard. I didn't choose to watch step up to the streets. I didn't. Uh-huh. Sure. Didn't. Yeah, totally. Someone else was watching it. And I was like, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> no, don't change it. Is that one of those movies that you just watch because it's ridiculous when you're high? Or I wasn't even I was off to Channing Tatum? I was or? trying to. It wasn't even Channing Tatum. I feel like it was his wife. It was kind of like Save the Last Dance. But I had eaten an edible and I was too high. <laughs> so I was like. This. So you couldn't use the remote? You were just looking at it <laughs> yeah. mystified? Like, well, I guess I'm watching Step Up I now. I just get mad every two seconds. Like, this is awful. And I throw my head in the pillow and just be like okay don't change it though <laughs> i'm trying to come down <laughs> these dance moves are sick <laughs> she stated that many hours of investigation and research had led her to the conclusion that he was innocent martinez claimed bolin was framed by police who gave his ex-wife specific details of the murders to say during her trial testimony is that true i wonder if that's true Conspiracy theory. <laughs> I mean, she seems like a smart lady, but I mean, she's blinded by love and D, but... Yeah. I don't know if it's true. I don't think yeah, that'd so. Be, yeah, probably not. I mean... I doubt it. After Boleyn's ex-wife died in 1992, Martinez believed prosecutors turned their attention to Boleyn's half-brother, Philip, and used the same tactic to get him to testify against his brother. We've discussed previously how family members are not credible witnesses mm -hmm. to the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that makes me believe that it he was it. true. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I don't know, his for his brother to turn against him without any history of there being a conflict between them. Maybe you know? he owed him money. Maybe there was conflict. Maybe he fucked his I didn't, wife. I didn't find anything. No? And I was looking on the internet. The oh. internet has everything. Oh, you're right. <laughs> you're right. I trust the internet. <laughs> and you. <laughs> Key witness Philip Bolin testified in the Matthews case that he had seen his stepbrother Oscar beating a woman wrapped in a sheet. This was damning testimony, which Rosalie believed was a lie fabricated by police. He didn't call the cops right then to report that? Right. What the fuck, Philip? <laughs> Fucking Philip. Rosalie's pursuit of Bolin's innocence drove a wedge between her and her family, especially her husband. But Rosalie was obsessed and kept going despite the resulting family issues. I can't imagine any husband being okay with that. Like, you're taking a road trip, leaving me and our kids. Yeah. And especially how controlling her husband was. Yeah, fuck that guy. Take that trip. Yeah, that's, tr that's fuck true. Fuck that guy, you're dude. Right. He doesn't have any say. You but made just... me wear fishnets and G-strings for <laughs> fucking years straight. All those leather outfits? Yeah, exactly. I'm taking a trip. I'm out of here. Should have given me one credit card. <laughs> Give me one Amex. I wouldn't have fucking gone to Kentucky. <laughs> After endless hours together over the course of a couple years, observers began suspecting there was a romantic relationship between the two. 
During one court hearing, a court reporter even witnessed Boleyn mouthing, I love you, at Rosalie. Jail officials claimed she had sex with Bolin in his cell. Rosalie denies this accusation, but was forced into quitting her job over the controversy. I hope she was fucking him, because you <laughs> lost your job. Oh, I bet God. she just walked out with her box of stuff, like, <laughs> took all her her belongings in her box and left the company and was just like, worth it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she just, like, skipping, skipping out of there. Out. Yeah. <laughs> Head all high and shit. <laughs> it was clear that Bolin was much more important to her than her family, and she became estranged from them. Rosalie says there was no love lost between her and her estranged husband, saying Victor had stopped telling her he loved her years earlier. Of course, public appearance needed to be maintained, and when asked, Victor would state his support of his wife and even his belief of Oscar Bolin's innocence. <laughs> What Damn. A tool. <laughs> By 1996, her husband Victor had enough and put his foot down. He said, If you go to Oscar's trial this morning, I will divorce you. She chose to attend the trial, and while sitting in court, one of the reporters handed her a post it that read, Victor Martinez has filed for divorce. So dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> a post it? Like, damn. Rosalie said she snapped and went to the defense table to throw the note at Oscar and exclaim, are you going to marry me now, you fucker? (laughs) What? (laughs) That's what she said. To which he responded, where's the preacher? This is hot. This is good. (laughs) This is the best. nipple rubbing, you guys. Yeah. (laughs) Nipple rub alert. (laughs) Damn. Good answer. Because most people are like, all right, sit down, crazy lady. Right. (laughs) Bitch, calm down. She keeps talking about marriage. She keeps saying the M word, and I'm not really <laughs> not just, down for that. Like, this is my court date, bitch. Like, just sit down. Can we talk about that? Damn. Yeah, after. Why is it always got to be about you during recess? <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. Rosalie left the courtroom to call her husband from the hallway while reporters listened in on their heated discussion. She divorced Victor and gave him custody of the children. That is fucked Mm -hmm. up. She's just like, that D is so important. I'm leaving my kids over it. That's how you know it was good. You know that sex in the cell was just... (laughs) That's "Mm." the true test. Yeah. So how good was that D, girl? Well, I left my kids. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, imagine if you get in there and you're about to fuck him in the cell and then he comes in like three seconds and then you're just like... Uh, if he was premature, I would just lose my shit. Like, yeah. do you have any idea? I lost my job, my yeah. husband, my kids, the credit cards I didn't have. Yeah, <laughs> I, was like, I wasn't here. Just e- good luck with your trial. <laughs> um, I guess I'll um, see you around or something. Yeah, it's not. It's not you. It's me. Okay, <laughs> I just need space, and I need to figure me out and do me. And yeah, yeah, get better D <laughs> and some credit cards. The day after the divorce shocker, the judge kicked Martinez out of the courtroom because she began shaking her head as Boleyn's stepbrother testified against Oscar. She's like, "Mm, nope, (laughs) this guy. (laughs) The trial was high profile and eventful, to say the least. A month later, Oscar and Rosalie got married. Oscar and Rosalie exchanged vows over speakerphone while Rosalie was in her Gainesville apartment and he was in jail. In 2020 coverage of the wedding, she wore her wedding dress and a picture of Oscar was displayed for the photo op. Aww. That's kind of cute. <laughs> she and Oscar were undoubtedly in love, but their marriage was also a publicity stunt and legal maneuver. They hoped the marriage would get media attention and possibly sway people into believing his innocence. Rosalie did many newspaper and TV interviews maintaining his innocence and talking about her romantic ideals of Oscar. She said she believed one day she would ride off into the sunset with Bolin once she proved his innocence. Ultimately, the jury disagreed with Rosalie, and soon after their wedding, he received another guilty verdict. It took just 30 minutes to convict him of the crimes a second time. Two days later, the same jury took only 28 minutes to again unanimously recommend Bolin be sentenced to the electric chair. You can't just go around saying someone's innocent on TV and newspaper. She probably should have just laid low, handled her shit, 
kept giving him handies in his jail cell <laughs> or whatever the fuck she did. And then maybe they'd be like, you know what? She's not she's not looking for fame like all the other groupies. Right. But instead, they just thought she was crazy. Nobody likes people in the media. Like people <laughs> who want attention like that, I guess. Yeah. It's clear she, that they're super thirsty. Yeah. She was trying to do good and then fucked herself over. Yeah. Aww. It's a really romantic story, though, I got to say. <laughs> Rosalie was counting on the fact that her reputation in the community would make the public more likely to listen to her claims and consider his innocence. Oh, what? That you abandon your kids and your husband? <laughs> that fucking reputation? No, because she had spent so many years as a with a previous eye. husband yeah. and the social eye and as a woman who had been in all these different career paths and yeah. people knew of her. So she thought she was banking on them just believing her because she had this past. Yeah, but you could but also... But all the that end, went out the window. Yeah, but you left all of that right. to pursue this. So why would you it do that? It does damage your credibility. A normal, sane person wouldn't fucking do that. Like, yeah. But nobody knows her background, how she didn't She didn't get any credit cards. I mean, right. if they knew, they'd yeah, probably Yeah, they probably didn't know that part. They just kind of saw her around. You yeah. Know? They were like, she went from this great, awesome, like, perfect life Career or woman, whatever. to a family woman. To fucking a guy in jail? Like, yep. I don't know if I would trust that either. Yeah. She said, I thought that if I made a big deal and I was his wife, that they were going to listen to the facts of his case. But it was in reverse. They were more interested in our love connection than me believing his innocence. I married him because I wanted to make them listen. I had such a good professional and personal reputation, but the minute I married Oscar, it was gone. Even though the plan didn't work, Rosalie maintains that Oscar is a great husband. Rosalie said, I can't ever expect him to change the oil in my car or take the garbage out or go to the movies, but he puts me on an emotional pedestal. He listens. He's there completely, 100%. He's not distracted. Nothing's more important than I am. Except for commissary snacks. <laughs> <laughs> Those honey buns. Yeah. <laughs> Some top ramen. <laughs> Since death row inmates are not allowed conjugal visits, there's no physical intimacy in their relationship. She could have kept her job and kept fucking him on the low. Right? Seems and like she was getting more D before they got married. Exactly. And still help support his case and not been distracted by, you know. Yeah. Oh, man, not ruined her whole <laughs> reputation. Right? Poor girl. Rosalie says that it's not a problem for her because they have such a deep emotional bond. Rosalie said, I find it very interesting why people would be interested in my sex life. It's no one's business, and that's just not part of our relationship. People say we are unable to have a proper relationship because we can't have sex. But what about if your husband is disabled or in the military? Oscar has never been mean to me or talked to me ugly or flirted or written another woman. He just raped and murdered another woman. Right. No big deal. Is that sloppy seconds? <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> the community was shocked and it was a big scandal for the whole family. People told the kids their mother was crazy. Everyone found it strange that the kids still had a relationship with their mother. Years later, Rosalie maintains her husband is not a murderer, despite being found guilty seven times. Rosalie Boleyn would go on to work on Casey Anthony's defense team. Ooh, she's good at her job. <laughs> Got Casey Anthony off. Boom. <laughs> she really, really likes people that, that murder. Yeah. <laughs> That's fucked up. And she doesn't like kids, apparently. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. No maternal instincts on this bitch. Damn. Oscar sends her love letters and hand-drawn cards practically every day. And Rosalie has kept them all. They are only allowed to see each other twice a week. Oscar once said, if they open these doors tomorrow and set me free, but I couldn't have Rosalie, I'd rather stay in prison. Rosalie often speaks of Oscar's kindness and how he makes her happy because he knows what she needs. She says the relationship makes her feel safe, secure, and confident. She is aware that people are skeptical but she doesn't get hung up on public perception and instead focuses on her own happiness. Rosalie said, if I die tomorrow, I die knowing that I've felt love that I've never felt before. It's an unconditional relationship. I don't think his motives are malicious, but if I'm hurt, that's okay. I'll move on. 
Rosalie's only regret is how her actions affected others, but she believes what she did was courageous because she stood up for what she believed in. Yeah. <laughs> That's something I can get behind. Yeah. No, actually, I mean, she's really, I mean. She sounds she, like a really strong woman. She's yeah. just been through some shit, you know? Yeah. And you're going from complete polar opposite, like, relationships. Someone who you had everything. You had the money. You had the kids. You had the husband. But you're really lonely and isolated. Right. And now you don't have the physical connection or the kids or really nice material things. He's not providing for you or whatever the fuck marriage is about. <laughs> 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 but he's got she, affection and love. And, right. And, and that was more important. Her. His attention. She's prioritizing that. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, that's it's really sweet. I know. Even if he did murder and she got sloppy seconds, <laughs> you know, it's really, really sweet. On January seventh, twenty sixteen, fifty-three-year-old Oscar Boleyn was given a lethal injection beginning at ten o five p.m. and was pronounced dead at ten sixteen. So that didn't work out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never volunteering. I'm never doing poetry at a fucking. Uh, I'm never going to a prison, not just never. for fun. I'm yeah. Don't don't even go near a prison because then you're gonna meet like correctional officers that are terrible, <laughs> just people that could ruin your fucking life, people that you don't want to be involved with. So. But there's so many cool Hot. shower scenes. <laughs> yes, yes. All the full frontal. Why I just, not? I want to stay away, but at the same time, I also want to go up to the like the fence on the yard, like when they're all working out, and just put my hands through and just sit there and just, just watch. Cool. Make them mad uncomfortable oh, yeah yeah creep them out yeah mm -hmm. kind of like in the terminator 2 or, or no is it terminator 2 when she's like looking at the playground and then it burns on fire but it's gonna be my pussy on fire <laughs> she's just like staring and she starts shaking the gate all like sarah connor's like freaking out like Whoa! it's gonna be like me but for my pussy <laughs> that's really embarrassing but i've never seen that <laughs> <laughs> okay I quit. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the end of Brianna and Kelly being friends. <laughs> Season finale. <laughs> You've never seen. Okay. Have you seen Terminator 1? Yeah, but it was forever ago. I don't remember okay, it. Well, the second one's better. For sure. Really? Yeah. Same thing with Aliens. Alien. And then the second Aliens is better. <laughs> <laughs> Do you wait, 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 wait. You can see it on my face. You haven't seen Alien. Oh my god. I know. Oh There's so god. many movies that I haven't seen. It's really embarrassing. It's like one of my deepest points of shame. It's like <laughs> There's so many good movies that everybody loves that I know people would judge the shit out of me if they knew that I god, didn't see it. What else? What's like a <laughs> Indiana Jones. Have you seen Indiana Jones? Yes, okay. Yes. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know you've seen Star Wars. Okay, mm -hmm, cool. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah, I don't know. It's just really weird. It's a weird thing. I love movies too. Yeah. That's the strangest thing. Yeah. Like, you know that. We go to movies together. Yeah, totally. But there's a shit ton of really good stuff that I didn't see. And most of it is stuff that I think came out when I was too young because I had the type of parents that were really strict. Yeah. And I had to, like, not watch uh -huh. movies that were for older kids. That's the And then I never went back and rewatched them. See, my dad made me watch Terminator 2 while I was, like, two. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I was so young. <laughs> was he trying to teach you a lesson? I don't like, know. Never I trust robots. Yeah. <laughs> I told him, too, that, like, he basically, as a kid, if you look at all my, like, nightmares and what I was scared, I was scared of Chucky, <gasps> Aliens, oh my God. Uh, Terminator, Exorcist. He made me watch all those you fucking movies. You still have nightmares, Jurassic, too. Yeah. Not about cool movies, but <laughs> Jurassic Park. Like, all those. I had That's terrible nightmares. Like, all my fears were like, okay, an alien's going to come down my hallway or a little doll is going to wake up. And I remember Jurassic Park was one of the first movies that I could see that was like PG-13. So and good. I read the book. And You yeah. read the book? Yeah. Oh, you're so cool. I was a fucking dork. <laughs> <laughs> was it a picture book with dinosaurs and people just getting it's a pop It was up. just a dinosaur book for like three-year-olds. <laughs> That's what I mean. That's a good one. <laughs> All right. So thanks again, everybody, for checking out another episode of Murder Dictionary. Before we uh, finish up, I just wanted to remind you guys that we are on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. So check us out there. We also have a Patreon. I will link that in the show notes. Put me through college. <laughs> Please. It's just community. Keep Kelly off the pole. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also, uh, if you want to rate, review, and subscribe, that would help us out. If you give us a five-star review, we definitely want to thank you on the show. So we are going to get to some reviews for this week. 
We wanted to thank Anne Jen, who said that she loved the show and she thinks that we are incredibly funny. So we appreciate you, Anne. Thank you for taking the time to review. Also, Spitfire said the hosts are smart and funny and we appreciate that. Thank you so much. I wonder if he's a rapper. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) I spit hot fire. fire. I spit hot fire. (laughs) And also, lastly, Linus and Lucy says she love in all caps us. So we love you too, Linus and Lucy. Thank you so much for your review. In all caps, we love you back. (laughs) Hard in all caps. So hard. Thanks again for reviewing. We appreciate that. We will always shout you out if you give us a five-star review. And I think... That's pretty much it. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, rate, review, subscribe, and thank you again for listening. Yeah, I'm going to go jerk off now. This is a hot episode. (laughs) (laughs) You want to (laughs) watch? Let me turn this off real quick. (laughs) I'm just going to sit in the corner and watch. Bring me a cucumber. (laughs) It's Sunday. Never mind. Spaghetti squash. (laughs) That's huge, dude. What the hell? Goals, you know? (laughs) I'm just trying. Box goals. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Okay. (laughs) Bye. Bye. (laughs) Hi, folks. Dirk Spentley here. Being on the go is a big part of my life. I love seeing new places, meeting new people, and performing all over the world. For energy on the go, for me, it's five-hour energy. It works fast, works long, and it tastes good. With zero sugar and four calories. Try it. It could work for your on-the-go life, too. Five-hour energy. Energy on the go. Get five-hour energy at your local 7-Eleven. Capital One presents a 30-second audio tour of Ireland. Sheep. Fairies. Golf. Charming Castle. Charming Castle. Charming Castle. Charming Castle. Charming Castle. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know you can actually go there when you use the Capital One Venture Card. You earn unlimited double miles on every dollar you spend on every purchase, which means you'll have plenty of miles to actually travel to Ireland. The Capital One Venture Card. What's in your wallet? Capital One Bank USA N.A. 